for coming to the Nantucket Civic League's Community Forum on Coastal Erosion. I'm Alan Reinhardt, President of the Civic League, and the series of forums that we do are designed to focus on community issues that uh, affect the quality of life or simply the quality of living on the island. We uh, go through a list. We have a board of directors and at the beginning of uh, our season in September we take a look and see what issues are before us. Coastal erosion was one that rose to the top so um, we did a forum several years ago on coastal erosion. The process continues and we felt it was time to do it again. Um, Sarah Okta, who's the director of the UMass Field Station, will be the moderator for today's event. She's the one who's uh, worked with us to help the, to pull the program together. Sarah, of course, is a former president and current vice president of the Civic League as well. So uh, without further ado, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, one of the first things I'd like to do is call to order our Coastal Management Plan meeting. Folks might not be aware, but we're in the midst of writing a Coastal Management Plan for the town of Nantucket, taking the entire island and dividing it up into 10 sectors, and then addressing each sector around the island in regards to erosion control measures, um, coastal change, um, storm smart preparation, fisheries use, energy siting and other issues that are important for Nantucketers. So we've been meeting for the last four or five months, twice a month, usually on a Monday night from five to seven at the public safety facility um, there in either the upstairs or the downstairs portion. And tonight in lieu of our normal meeting, we are convening here to hear some information that we feel is very important to our understanding of the type of um, situations and issues and science and data and policy that we all need to understand in order to help write a, a well-versed and well-written uh, management plan. There's tons of, of seats, so don't be afraid to come forward. And our first speaker spoke um, about six, seven years ago at the uh, Civic League Forum that I uh, helped lead, uh, that we held over at the LGI, and uh, his name is Jim O'Connell. He has been a colleague of mine for many years. He and I started doing beach profiles with citizen scientists at Codfish Park, at uh, Great Point, and at the sewer beds here on Nantucket. Um, he was working for the Coastal Zone Management Department and for the Sea Grant version of Woods Hole, doing a large citizen science profiling project for beach profiling throughout the state. He also worked as an agent of the Barnstable Extension Office and is an extremely knowledgeable uh, coastal geologist with a lot of um, experience working out in the field and reviewing different projects. And his path has taken many different turns throughout the state and uh, throughout different municipalities and private folks. And he's just someone who knows a ton about uh, coastal erosion processes and um, how a beach functions and what to expect at the shoreline. We'll start out with Jim. After Jen's done, I'll jump up here and introduce Jeff Carlson. Unfortunately, Steve McKenna was supposed to speak today. Steve has been leading us, along with uh, Dave Franzetto and, and uh, Carl, Jeff Carlson, in our coastal management plan process. And Steve McKenna is with Coastal Zone Management. He's the Cape and Islands Regional Coordinator. And he had a family emergency that he absolutely could not do anything about. So he extends his uh, deepest regrets. He has been presenting shoreline change map data along with Julia Nisel and Rebecca Haney. So at several of our meetings, we've been presenting new information from the state on both FEMA uh, changes and on shoreline change maps that have just come out and have been updated from the state. And these maps are quite helpful when uh, looking around the island and figuring out what's happening with our shorelines. And if it's any consolation with uh, my college students and with students from the Nantucket Middle School and students all over the United States, I've been continuing the beach profiling data management 
measurements and hopefully we'll be able to provide those to everybody soon. So without further ado, Jim O'Connell. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Civic League and Sarah from the UMass uh, Nantucket Field Station for inviting me here again to do another talk. I must have said something right. I'm not sure what it is, but I must have said something good. Um, in, 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 in the way of my background, Sarah touched on it, but I, I thought I might reiter reiterate um, the path I'm taking to get to here today before you. Um, I started out uh, with the uh, State Coastal Zone Management Office. I was a coastal geologist and hazards coordinator for that organization for 13 years. I left there and went to uh, Barnstable County and was the Marine Resource Specialist for a year for the Cape Cod Commission. Got offered a job at the uh, Sea Grant Program at the Oceanographic Institution of Woods Hole where I spent 10 years. Uh, the Sea Grant Program, federal agency, always has enough funding to go to one national conference per year. So I picked the North Shore of Oahu to go to my national conference one year after 10 years being there. And I was in one of the lectures um, listening to someone from the Sea Grant program at the University of Hawaii. Now, I was a, I'm a Sea Grant person, spent 10 years with the program in Woods Hole. I'm sitting here next to one of the professors at the University of Hawaii, and the person who was doing the presentation said, and by the way, we have an opening in the Sea Grant program here in Hawaii. So I leaned over and um, budded uh, Chip uh, Fletcher, a uh, coastal geologist with the coastal uh, geology program at the University of Hawaii, and he said, uh, what's this with an opening with the Sea Grant program? He goes, oh, it's on the island of Kauai. He said, where's Kauai? Three months later, I was on a plane flying to the island of Kauai as the coastal geologist Sea Grant representative to set up a, a research and education program on the island of Kauai, where I spent two years. The island of Kauai is the northernmost developed island in the island chain. It's 25 miles wide and 30 miles long. I spent a couple of years there, so I know a little, little bit about island living, which uh, I had never planned on coming back. So, but when I did come back, I came back uh, because of my family, which is why Steve McKinn is not here. So I spent about a year in, uh, clinically depressed because I thought I was in Kauai for the rest of my life, doing shoreline change work and doing educational uh, field trips for anybody who would listen. So after my depression got over, I got offered a job as a conservation agent in the town of Situate on the South Shore arguably one of the most hazard-prone community, coastal communities in the Commonwealth in terms of northeast storms. So I spent two years there, and um, I have since um, left there. Um, I just finished a stint with FEMA, dealing with Hurricane Sandy on the south shore of Rhode Island and some in Massachusetts. And uh, that whole disaster field office moved from Rhode Island in now in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, dealing with Nemo, which is the northeast storm that happened in early February. All the New England states have been declared uh, disaster areas in terms of the northeast storm, except Massachusetts, and we're anxiously waiting for that disaster declaration for public assistance uh, monies. Uh, in the meantime, I started a private practice, <laughs> which is Coastal Advisory Services. So, you know, I've touched a little bit from the feds to the state, to the county, to the local, to the private sector. So I'd like to think I have somewhat of a, somewhat of a balanced perspective, and the whole time doing science, education, doing reports, working with people, um, you know, getting them out in the field, doing field trips and so forth. So um, I've traveled around the country looking at a lot, of, a lot of other states, looking at how they manage their shorelines, and then looking at the science of how this all works. So my goal today, as all of my presentations are, I'm hoping that everybody here walks out of this room knowing at least one thing you didn't know before you came in. And if that happens, then I would consider this a success. So um, with all that, um, my original presentation was on coastal erosion control alternatives. Never used the word solution because there, there's, there's no soft solution, there's no hard solution. There are alternatives or techniques. So I was putting my presentation together and I had about 150 slides with all the erosion control alternatives you can think of, from non-structural to structural to relocation. And then I talked with Sarah and she, she said, well, we're putting together a coastal management plan on the island. So I, in midstream, I said, all right, well, maybe I'll take my talk and I'll, I'll just veer off a little bit. Maybe I'll add in, rather than do it all on erosion control structures, their, their, you know, their performance, how long they last, where they work, where they don't work, what their impacts are, what their benefits are. And I said, well, I, I only have 30 minutes. So 
So I'm going to veer off a little bit and I'm going to talk a little bit about erosion, erosion control and so forth. But then at the end I decided, well, maybe I could just throw out some issues that I've learned about that have been successful when I'm in my travels around the country in terms of managing the shoreline. So I threw those in and sort of veered off my original presentation. So, um, and that was just yesterday. And yesterday I ran into this slide here. Um, I was the only I was coming to, come to Nantucket, you know, I've read all the, all the scientific literature I could in terms of coastal studies and shoreline change and everything. I said, I think I'll just flip through Bob Oldeal's The uh, Geologic Evolution of Cape Cod and the Islands. He's a, Bob Oldeal's a, ge a geo coastal geology, uh, actually not coastal, he's a geology icon with the U.S. Geological Survey. So I was just flipping through that, and I got to the back part of the book, just to re refresh my memory. And he said something at the back of the book, which is going to be on my last slide. But, what, but that triggered me to put this up here as my first slide. Do you know what this is? Do you, doesn't it look like a remarkable resemblance to Nantucket? If we just kind of slid this little, this little thing up here, slid this up here, then we rock, we, I, was, I was stunned by this picture. Does anybody know what it is? What, what it is and where it is? Uh, I'm going to show you anyway, even if you knew. Uh, this is Billingsgate Shoal, and up here, you see this right here? So this is, this is a, it's a shoal. This here is this here. It's riprap. It's basically a breakwater trying to protect the lighthouse that used to be out here. Here's the, here's the, here's the shoal here. Here's the riprap that was trying to protect that little dot right there, which is a lighthouse. This is where it used to be located, right here, off of, uh, off of Jeremy Point in Wellfleet. It was Billingsgate Island in the mid-1800s. Now, that's not long ago. It was one mile long, a half a mile wide. It had 30 homes on it. It had a lighthouse and a schoolhouse and a thriving fishing fleet. That was the mid-1800s, and that's what it looks like today. That's not, that's not a lot of time to have passed. So the important thing of showing this is one, the remarkable resemblance to Nantucket, but the question is, why did Billingsgate Island, an island with 30 homes, disappear? And it has a lot to do with the whole beach processes issue, and particularly what's happening here along the island, along the shorelines. Sediment transport, sand transport along the shore, which I'll, I'll describe very briefly. The sediment transport, the sand movement system along the shore changed. And because the sand transport direction changed, the island had no longer had a sediment supply and started to diminish, started to erode, and now it's basically just turned into a shoal. What happened was this. Here's the Cape Cod National Seashore. Here's where the island was. It, when the northeast storms come down, they, they take the waves, the northeast, northeast waves, which are our strongest storms, the predominant wave direction, comes down, hits the, hits the uh, Cape Cod National Seashore, and right about at this point here, the, at here, the sand transports down here and, and forms the Monomoy Shoals, but when it hits here, because of the curvature, the sand was also coming up in this direction here. Well, when the west storms, the northwest storms, which is the prevailing storms, where we get most of our wind in terms of frequency, we get most of our winds coming here, get rid of Provincetown. Provincetown doesn't exist. When the northwest waves came down here, it used to hit this shoreline. These, this, all, this, all this area here is, is outwash plain. That's pretty much what you have here along your entire south side and the eastern shore. Uh, caught from north of Codfish Park, the outwash plains, glacial outwash, beautiful sandy pebble deposits. Well, that's what all the national seashore is as well. So when the northwest winds were coming down here, they would hit these outwash plains, just like you, just like you have here on the island. They may be 15 to 50 feet high, and the sediment transport direction came down here, came to Jeremy Point, and fed the island and kept the island healthy in terms of its sediment supply. Now. Back to the northeast storms. As the northeast storms eroded this side of the outwash plain, the sand transport up here started to create Provincetown. That's how it created Provincetown. The erosion of the Cape Cod National Seashore, sediment transport, sand transport coming up here, a little here, a little here, a little here, a little here. Provincetown built out, built out, built out, and that's why you have Provincetown here today, because of erosion of the Cape Cod National Seashore's sediment transport. Well, because of Provincetown, the northwest winds that come down here now hit Provincetown instead of these bluffs. It lost its sediment supply. Okay, so that's going to play a key. That theory is going to play, it's not a theory, that fact is going to, it's going to play into the remainder of my presentation in terms of how the whole system works. So sediment supply is, is, is very important. So that's, that's what happened to, uh, to Billingsgate Island. 
So, talking about shoreline change and sediment supply. This is when I, when I do lectures, I like to talk about shoreline change, shoreline change data in particular, and, and what the importance is. So I'm, gonna run, I'm just gonna run you quickly through these pictures. Codfish Park, you'll, you'll all recognize it, I'm sure you've all been here. Here's Codfish Park in 1991. Low altitude photograph was taken. You can see the number of houses. I believe I counted 25 or so in this particular picture here. This was in 1991 after the, uh, after the uh, no name Halloween uh, Northeast storm. So you jump from 1991, 1995, well, there's still a few houses here. August 1970, excuse me, August 1997, one row of houses, and if you go back here today, you don't see any. Well, this plays into looking at, looking at data. Now, I wasn't gonna say a lot about the shoreline change because Steve McKenna from the CZM office, they're the ones who provide the funds to generate the shoreline change data. When I was with the Sea Grant program at the Oceanographic Institution, I worked with USGS and we added the, 19, the early 1990s shoreline along 1,500 miles of shore. We added that to four or five other historic shorelines going back to the mid 1800s. So now the database consists of about six, on average about six historic shorelines going back to the 1800s, mid 1800s, late 1800s, turn of the century, 1950, 1970s, 1991, and I, CZM just contracted out and added a, a 2007 or 2009 shoreline. But the point, the point is this, the point is, is that if you looked at the shoreline change data for this particular location, and I was, again, I was gonna leave it up to Steve to talk about the data, but Steve's not here, so I'm gonna steal some of his time and get into, just talk a little bit about the, uh, the show and change maps that are available from the, uh, the Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management uh, website. So if you look at the, 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 the data uh, for Codfish Park, most, most of the time, if you're a planner, you're not gonna look at all the, you know, it's a massive data set, 1,500 miles of shore, six shorelines, transects at 20 meter intervals, there's, there's tens of thousands of numbers to play with. So the planners generally take the long-term average annual shoreline change rate. That's how, that's how geologists and planners present the data. It's eroding or accreting at one, approximately one foot per year. Now we know shorelines don't erode at one foot per year. They pulse during storms primarily. So you'll get overwash, and, but that's, sort of captured in that long-term rate. So with the six shorelines, and I looked at the new shoreline, with the seven shorelines in the data set, this data set still shows Codfish Park as an accretional shoreline. So if a planner looks at, at, the, at, at the data, um, what, they, what they would see would be, ah, this is an accretional shoreline. It's accreting at about a half a foot to a foot per year on, a, on the average. Um, but if you look at the data, the shorelines in between, and these colored lines here, are the historic shorelines. But again, when, if you're a planner, oftentimes you look at that one long-term number. The greeny shoreline, it's not a bad place to, not a bad place to, to, to build uh, some type of structure. Well, what happened at Codfish Park is from the mid-1800s or maybe even before that, it was in an accretional cycle from the mid-1800s to sometime around the 1950s. Around the 1950s, and this is just based on the shorelines we have, around the 1950s, that trend, that complete um, accretional trend reversed. During that accretion, what I'm, from what I'm told, during that accretion is when all those houses were built. Those are small cottages, I guess they were cottages that were built for some of the helpers, you know, working on other issues around the island. First row of houses went in, well, the beach accreted more. Second row of houses went in, the, creek, the beach kept accreting. Maybe it will never stop accreting. And then in the 1950s, it reversed. And you just went right back. And my understanding was that the waves were washing up against the, uh, the, the road here at one, at one point in time and now the beach, beach has, again, has accreted somewhat. But if you go back and look at the data, even with the new shoreline, it's still showing it's an accretional shoreline. The, the shoreline is fluctuating incredibly, and I did that when I was looking at the data. I looked for areas around the state. I was looking for a zero number that would say, it's a stable shoreline, go for it. And what I saw in many of them was fluctuations of 50 to 150 feet, erosion, accretion, erosion, accretion. But if you look at that one data, you might be encouraged and you may want to. You may want to. Now, these, um, there's, the, there's, the, here's the colored shorelines here, and over here are the, the bracketed dates. You can get the exact year, actually, but they're just they're snapshots in times from aerial photographs and old uh, NOS T-sheets and, and, and other NOAA charts and so forth. But you can get these from the, the Mass Coastal Zone Management website. If you just did a search, Mass Coastal Zone Management, shoreline change data, you'll, these will come up and you'll be able to look anywhere in Massachusetts and just put your, put your, um, your icon on there and you can look at uh, whatever's happening around the island or anywhere else in terms, of, uh, in terms of the data and you can look at the shorelines to see how the shoreline is actually, actually moving, accreting or eroding or 
fluctuating like most shorelines do, except one area in Nantucket, which I'll get into later. Um, I thought it was important to point out some of the some of the more important things that are happening along the Massachusetts shore now in terms of the, uh, this incredible winter we had. Hurricane Sandy, Tropical Storm Sandy, and then three back-to-back -back nor'easters. And for the east-facing shores, it was great alteration. You'll hear a coastal geologist not use the word damage. They'll say, oh, great alteration to the, to the shoreline, but to the people who own property, it was damaged. And this is, this is something that I'm gonna keep a, a close eye on because this is going to be a precedent-setting decision and an, an extremely difficult decision for the state to make, um, which they're gonna have to make very soon. This is um, this Massachusetts, you know, you know, okay, so you know Nantucket here, Cape Cod, Boston's right here. Plum Island is a barrier beach up here. It's about seven miles long. The northern part of it is developed, and the southern part is a, is a, um, a federal um, wildlife sanctuary. So I'm going to bring you to the northern part of Plum Island here. Here's the, here's the, here's the barrier. It's a barrier island. There's a bridge going to it. So a barrier island is made up of beach and dune and intertidal flats. All right, and I'll tell you about the regulations in a minute, but you can look at this barrier island here. Here's what it looks like uh, from, a Google, from a Google aerial. You can see there were some groins built here. Groins are usually made of riprap, sometimes they're made of geotextile fabrics. Groins are put on a beach for the primary reason of trapping sediment to make a beach. It's the same thing as a jetty, only jetties are built at the entrance to harbors. It's the same material, but they function, their function is different. So you can see some groins here on the beach trapping sand. You can see a radical trapping of sand here. There's significant erosion of the downdrift side. Why? Of course, because it's trapping the sediment transport. So these people are having a severe erosion problem and these people, up until these last, last few northeasters, were enjoying a very wide, stable beach, and storm protection that beaches generally provide. So here's what it looks like, and this is a blow-up of what some of the houses looked like um, before, this, before this winter. This was uh, taken in 2008. This is what it looked like in early March. So we went through early February, Nemo, the northeast storm. We had another one in March. We had a hurricane or tropical storm Sandy while it got here, and then a week later, a, a northeast storm after this. But March 9th, this is what, this is what it looked like. It was pretty devastating in terms of, in terms of property damage. Um, so they lost their beach. Here's the houses here. This was, this was, their, this was their reaction. And I'm gonna, I'll talk about the, regulation, the state regulations in a minute. But this was, this was the homeowner's reaction. I should tell you about it now. The regulations say that you cannot prohibit, you cannot inhibit waves from removing sand from a coastal dune. That's what they say. They don't say you can't build a seawall, revetment, growing. They just say you cannot prohibit, inhibit waves from removing sand from a coastal dune. Well, this is, this is the reaction that the homeowners had. They just came in one morning and just said, go for it. Bring in as much rock as you can. Armor this coastal dune as best you can or we're going to lose our homes. So, uh, you know, a pretty understandable decision by a homeowner who's, who's about to lose their primary residence. Well, I said, I have to go up there and see this. So I went up a couple of weekends ago. I have to see what this looks like. I need my own photographs, which I've done all my career. I can, I can read books. I can look at pictures, but I want to go there. I want to go out during the storm. I want to see how it happened. So I, I form movies in my head. Well, if you can see this picture here, I went up uh, April 13th to see what it looked like. And everybody except one property owner completely covered the stones with sand, which is one of the requirements for the mainland where if you are allowed under specific circumstances to build, to build a revetment, for example, most of the communities, particularly on the Cape, require that you calculate the volume of sand that's coming out of it and you have to cover the structure and keep it covered at all times. Well, that's what they did, which was good. But they did not engineer this, which was one of their big mistakes. So nobody's gonna put a stamp on this. So, you know, I think that's, a, that's that was one of the follies. They just came and dumped it and didn't really engineer it. They didn't have time, they wanted to do it immediately. So, but they did cover it with sand and this is what it, and this is what it looks like now. So what was the reaction? Well, six houses were lost. And I know, you know, uh, the storms were pretty devastating here in the island as well. Six houses were lost and at present there's about 40 houses that, 40 houses that are, are at risk. So. They went to the, of course, the newspapers went up there and took a lot of videos. You may have seen them on the, you know, on the, on the television, the front page of the papers, but the extent of this winter's erosion has forced people to take matters into their own hands. That was one of the, spokes, the, one of the homeowner spokesmen. Well, what do the regulators say? What do the state regulators say? You can't prohibit a wave from taking sand out of a dune. So the regulators said, well, we'll keep doing what you're doing, but 
We will later review the reinforcements to determine whether they meet the environmental standards of the state wetlands protection regulations. If the work fails to meet the standard, the agent may require work to bring the area back into compliance. Everybody's waiting with bated breath to see what happens here. This is a pretty precedent-setting decision and, and a very difficult decision that's going to be made. Uh, and you'll understand in a minute what the impacts of well, I, what the impacts of armoring this area is going to do to the people who didn't armor. Um, what did the legislative What did the legislative body say? Well, Senator Bruce Tarr, uh, who's a Republican from Gloucester, filed a bill to create a commission on coastal erosion designed to aid communities who live near the ocean. So that bill is pending before the legislature now. They want to form form a commission to see what they can do about coastal erosion. So let's take a look at coastal erosion and see what we think about what they may or may not be able to do. Uh, in, terms of, um, you know, in terms of what's happening around the country, uh, in, in the year 2000, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, was cons the legislature, excuse me, was considering having the Federal Emergency Management Agency not only get into the um, flood insurance business, but get into the erosion insurance business, coastal erosion insurance. But they needed a study to determine whether it was cost effective. So they hired the Heinz Center for Science, Economics, and the Environment in April 2000 to do a nationwide study. Is it cost effective for the federal government to get in the insurance business to try to reduce the expenditures of disaster relief. So is, would it be more cost effective to do insurance? I'll go in every single storm and just start paying individual and public assistance money. Was there a balance there? They needed that, answer quest, uh, that question answered. So they went out and they did it. And what they found out was, if you, as you can see, about 350, there's about 350,000 structures that are within 500 feet of the shore. 87,000 of these structures are within the 60-year erosion zone, meaning if the data are correct, Within 60 years, we should lose, lose about 87,000 structures. And every year, that comes down to be about 1,500 structures nationally that will be lost due to coastal erosion. And it's a, home, a homeowner cost of approximately somewhere around $530 million. Now, this is nationally. Well, that was enough to convince the legislature to say, we think FEMA should get into the erosion insurance business as well. So the debate went on, the debate went on, and it kind of quietly went away. And I haven't heard a word in the last 10 years about where that legislation went but it's still sleeping somewhere, and it may wake up someday. So let's talk a little bit about the causes of coastal erosion. And we all know storm waves and surge obviously cause coastal erosion. And if you know the science behind it, I can look at the wave buoys, and I can tell you whether or not the beach is going to lower, and there's going to be significant erosion of the beach, or whether we're going to get significant overwash. And it all has to do with the shape of the wave and the type of waves that you see in the wave buoys. And I don't have time to go into that, but there is a very simple way to look at waves to determine whether we're going to have massive overwash or we're going to have massive erosion of the sand going the other way. But we all know that storm waves and surge cause coastal erosion. I think that's, that's, um, that's pretty clear. But let's take a look at the other two. Let's take a look at uh, where we're at on, on, on sea level rise studies and what the predictions are uh, currently and what the predictions are in the future. Now we know that sea level was somewhere between th approximately 350 to 400 feet lower than it is today, 20,000 years ago, when the 22, 20,000 years ago, when the glaciers reached their maximum, which was Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Block Island, Long Island, that's as far as they went. So all the water that was in the ocean being held up in the glaciers, sea level was about 400 feet lower. So you could actually walk out to George's Bank, you could walk about 20 miles south of Nantucket uh, on dry land, and we know that because we found land, uh, evidence of land organisms and animals out on George's Bank, mastodon trunks that fishermen have pulled up. So we know that was dry land. So it was about 300, maybe 400 feet lower than it was today, and it's continuing to rise. If you look at the current trends today that NOAA NOAA, USGS, and other scientific organizations have calculated over about the last 100 years, sea level slowed about 3,000 years ago. And I was talking with Sarah today, and some of her colleagues, she and some of her colleagues have done marsh coring to determine the age of the marsh. When did marshes start to form? Others have done it on the mainland. Redfield from the Oceanographic Institution did it in Barnstable Harbor. So the marshes started to form about three, 4,000 years ago. So we found out that sea level, started to, the sea level rise started to slow at that point in time. And that allowed um, the substrate to start to build and, and, and plants to start to, um, start to grow behind the barrier beaches. So most of the marshes are somewhere between three and 5,000 years old. But if we look over the last uh, about 100 years, we can see that based on tide gauge data, Sea level is still rising, like for example in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Sea level, the sea level rise trend over the past uh, about, a, about 100 years from, is about oh, almost, a foot, oh, almost a foot over the last 100 years. If we look at the Boston area, it comes out to be about the same. It's a, 
approximately one vertical foot every 100 years over the past 100 years. And this is uh, primarily based on, based on tide gauge data. Uh, same thing with Nantucket. If you look at the Nan uh, Nantucket um, data, looking at from the tide gauges, it's about 0.9 feet over the last 100, over the past 100 years. So sea level's been rising about one vertical foot every 100 years. Now, sea level worldwide, which we say the eustatic rise worldwide, it's only rising about four to six inches. Yet in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, these areas, it's rising a foot. Why is that? Well, the land mass is sinking in, in, this, in this general area, and it has to do with glacial, it has to do with the weight of the glacier and the, and the, and the, and the loss of the ice. The land is actually, has actually gone up and gone down a couple of times, and all the land is trying to do is equilibrate. We happen to be in a downward trend of the land mass. The land mass is sinking presently about twice as fast as the eustatic is rising. But if you put both of those together, you come up with about one vertical foot over the last 100 years. Uh, for this entire area. One vertical foot doesn't sound like a lot, and I haven't seen any other studies other than this one, but um, several colleagues at the uh, Oceanographic Institution, Institution in Woods Hole years, several years ago said, well, what does that mean, one vertical foot? You know, so they calculated how much land, upland, not marshes, but how much upland is being lost as a result of one vertical foot in sea level rise, and they come up about, six, about 65 acres of upland are lost every year due to this one foot rise. So they figured, oh, maybe about 3,000 acres in the next 45 years. But just keep in mind, one vertical foot, 65 acres. That's that low-lying area that's right next to, next to the ocean. That's being very slowly inundated, very slowly uh, turning into ocean. Now recently, we've had the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where about 2,000 scientists worldwide decided to study sea level rise, but particularly the predictions because we were seeing this trend in, in climate change, particularly global warming. So various scientists have come up with uh, several predictions on what they think sea level is going to do in the future. And this was, these, were, um, these, are re these were recent estimates up to 2008, 2007. One of the studies said, oh, about a six meter rise by 2100. So in about, in about 100 years or so, maybe a 0.6 meter rise. Well, this scientist uh, came up with 1.8. The scientists came up with about two meter rise. So what all the scientists are saying now is it's reasonable, the mid-range, it's reasonable to suggest that planners ought to start thinking about a three foot rise in, one, in the next 100 years. That's the mid-range. It's not the high range, it's not the low range, it's the mid-range. So about three foot of sea level rise over the next 100 years if the trends that we're seeing now continue. And they are continuing according to the data. Uh, but now, the scientists have learned how to now start, um, start factoring in the thermal expansion of the ocean and glacier melting. Believe it or not, some of the early predictions, we didn't have the models. and They weren't accurate enough for the scientists to have confidence enough to go public with the, uh, with the models. But now we are uh, adding in thermal expansion of the ocean and meltwater is entering into the, into the ocean and they're coming up uh, with new predictions. Now recently, this stunned me, recently, USGS, and you can find um, a summary of, the, of this report in, uh, in the USGS Sound Waves. It's their, it's their monthly newsletter, and you can go on the internet again and just look for Sound Waves on the USGS. They, um, just a couple of months ago, came out with sea level rises accelerating along the Atlantic shore. Now, they did something really interesting. Remember I told you about this, the shoreline change data? You look at the long-term shoreline change data, you get a long-term trend. Don't look at that number alone. You've got to look what's happening in between. Well, USGS, I think, was the first organization to do that. They said, well, let's, let's break the data down into chunks and see if there's more than just this long-term trend. And sure enough, they found that um, from about North Carolina to Newfoundland, we have a hot spot, what they're calling a hot spot. Sea level, the worldwide sea level, the land mass aside, the, world, the, the eustatic, uh, excuse me, the, the sea level rise between North Carolina and Newfoundland is about three to four times faster than the eustatic rise. Now, that's not counting the landmass sinking. And the reason is this, because the, the ocean temperature has, ri uh, has risen to may maybe three degrees Fahrenheit you know, over the last 10 to 20 years, and that's been measured as well. So be uh, because of that, glaciers have been in climate change, global warming, glaciers are melting, more fresh water coming in. There's three oceanographic currents that interact in this particular area, particularly a little north of here. One of them has slowed. And because of the slowing of the North Atlantic overturning current, um, this, the ocean level actually, actually tilts down towards our land mass here. And because of the slowing of this oceanographic current, all the ocean mass is doing is trying to get back up and equilibrate, to equilibrate to a flat surface, what nature does almost all the time. That's also, so it may be a short-term uh, phenomenon, but they did measure that 
in this area for at least for the next few decades, and if climate change, particularly global warming, continues, then they're, in, they're anticipating that this acceleration is going to continue. So that's third, three to four times faster. What they're suggesting now is maybe the planners ought to start thinking of not three feet, maybe three to five feet in the next 100 years, because we don't know how long it's going to take for this ocean surface to a cool break. But you can read that yourself in this article here if you do a search on sound waves uh, on the USGS, um, um, USGS um, site. This, this stunned me as well. Now, for somebody like Admiral Lockley III, they come out as the top, America's top military officer in the Pacific. Now, he deals, he deals with, with hostile actions in North Korea, escalating tensions between China and Japan in the entire Pacific region. Well, they asked him point blank, what's the biggest long-term security threat in the Pacific region? And the reporters were a little stunned by his, by his answer, and he said climate change and particularly sea level rise. And the reason is, some of, a lot of the smaller islands in the Pacific are being flooded more frequently, and they're seeing larger storms, which means a lot of these climate change will, he, what he said was, you have the real potential here in the not too distant future of nations being displaced by sea level rise in the Pacific. Where are these people gonna go? Right now we don't know. So they're gonna be island nations that are gonna have to move off the islands and go somewhere. And he's just thinking that climate change will cripple the security environment, probably more likely than the other scenarios we all talk about. Well, that, whether true or not, for somebody like that to come out publicly and say that really stunned me and made me think about how important all of this is in the context of just not individual houses or individual communities, but national security as well. Now we know from other data, we know we're in an, inter we're in an interglacial period. The glaciers are gone climate's warming, sea levels rising, and we know we've had at least four other interglacial, inter interglacial periods, at least four, maybe five, but we know five we've mapped. The last interglacial period, we're at the interglacial period, we're kind of, we're pretty much at the top of the interglacial period, but the last interglacial period, sea level was about four to six meters higher than it is now. Will it go that high? Nobody's willing to go out on a limb and predict that. All we do know is that it was about four to six, about four to six meters higher um, at the last interglacial than it is now. So, what are, you know, what are our options? If sea level rise is accelerating and global temperatures continue to rise, then these rates of sea level rise, that acceleration is gonna continue. And the USGS actually went out, out on a limb and, and stated that. And I think they're some of the national experts in terms of looking at the science and management and trying to bring those, bring those two together. So what will that mean in terms of uh, climate change, global warming, sea level rise? Well, obviously, we're gonna see storm surges, higher storm surges. Right now, we've got the flood insurance rate maps that show us the base flood elevation, the, the approximate elevation of the 100-year storm, which is the storm that has a 1% frequency, a 1% chance of hitting in any given year. It's not every 100 years like we used to think 10 years ago. 1% chance. So obviously we're gonna see higher storm surges. This is my neighborhood here. This is, uh, this is uh, Southern Marshfield, Northern Duxbury on the South Shore. I'm astounded, I'm astounded that those houses are still alive and still standing. It's because there's a, there's a vertical concrete seawall in front of the houses. I'll talk about vertical concrete seawalls in a minute and I'll show you some pictures of what it looks like now. Obviously, in terms of passive inundation, we're going to get land subject to coastal storm flow, which basically the 100-year floodplain that's mapped by FEMA on our flood insurance rate maps. Uh, we're obviously going to see, you know, more frequent inundation of not only dry lands because it's going to reach farther inland because the sea level has rose, but we're going to see more frequent inundation, and we're, and we're seeing that already. I mean, you know, if you if you if you know the shore, you live around the floodplains. You, you ask yourself, these storms seem to be increasing. The intensity seems to be increasing. Is it real? Well, you'll have to tell me. I see it. So I think it may be real. Will it last long? I don't know, but it's happening now because I see it. And you live on an island. You must see it as well. So we're going to get in, in, more inundation uh, of uh, normally, basically normally dry land. I think they said, uh, I read recently, and they were talking about New York because of, the, because of um, Tropical Storm Sandy. They said, if sea level continues to rise at the rate it's rising, in about 50 years or so, they're going to see the 100-year storm happening on more of a 10-year frequency storm in terms of the frequency of, of inundation. That's pretty significant. And obviously, we're going to accelerate coastal erosion. Higher storm surge, more frequent, more intense storms. Obviously, we're going to increase our erosion rates to some degree. So this is what, um, this is Spring Hill Beach after the October 1991 storm taken by my colleague Jim Mahala. Uh, but you can see what it looks like here. Most of those houses had enough room to move back. 
The Plum Island people didn't have any, most of them didn't have enough room to move back. There's no more room to move. They're basically at the end of the trail. Um, a lot of these houses in Spring Hill Beach and Situate had room to move the houses back, which they, which they did. And, um, but not only are we going to you know, see more uh, erosion, but salt marsh loss, we're seeing that already. We've mapped um, in the, on Duck Creek Beach on the South Shore. We've mapped uh, since, the, since the 1970s, we've lost about seven acres of salt marsh, basically just being passively inundated and slumping off. So about seven acres have been mapped just recently. Um, uh, inundation of wells and septic systems along the shore as well as the habitat change. That may not be bad, it may be good, but it's something we're going to have to watch and, and, and consider. So, in terms of Codfish Park, what I did was I just looked at the last two shorelines we did. Now we know it's on, our, it, if you look at the long-term data, which is right here, these are the transects. On, the, on here you see 0.59 feet. So it's accreting over that long term at about 0.6 feet per year. Well, I, I, I wouldn't use that alone. So I just looked at the last two shorelines, 2000 and the new one in 2009, and Codfish Park is back into an erosional trend. Will that continue? Uh, nobody can really answer that. But I do know that um, you know, it's, it's the sand transport again. It's the shoals offshore. My understanding why Codfish Park was changing so much, why the south side of the sewer beds, when the sewer beds were going to be expanded back in the 1990s, I think, early 1990s, you're talking about, I think, putting another um, set of beds out there, so, but, uh, and, and there was an accretional there. All of a sudden, the accretion changed, and they started losing land, so uh, they hired a company that went out and started looking at the shoals, an old man shoal that used to exist off the southwest corner at that time disappeared, and we, we believe that's why higher waves started reaching the shore, and it went back into an erosional cycle. You've got that beautiful shoal off the southeast corner off of Codfish Park. Maybe that's the reason why this goes through its fluctuation. Maybe that shoal comes and goes. But that's one of the reasons why we see changes in sand transport, just like you saw on Billingsgate Island. Um, in the southwest corner, um, I, I started looking at the shoreline change data, but I thought Steve McKenna was going to be here to do this, so I didn't, I didn't want to step in his toes, so I, I didn't put any data on this, but I do know. I showed this because um, the southwest corner of Nantucket, before this new shoreline happened, had the highest unidirectional, one-directional shoreline change rates that I found in all of the Commonwealth, and it was an erosional cycle. Um, basically somewhere between 9 and 12 feet per year on average. Again, it doesn't happen 9 to 12 feet, but these are, the, and, it was all, and it was all erosion. So if you go on CCM's website and you pull up this area here, it'll actually show you where the shoreline was in the mid-1800s, late-1800s, and it's, it's pretty fascinating. But the, so I did look at the new data, and I didn't want to put it up here because I thought Steve was going to do it, but it, it still has the same erosion rates. It still has somewhere between 8 or 9 and 12 feet per year on average. So it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty significant. Um, in Falmouth, uh, Falmouth formed a coastal resources group several years ago to look at the south shore of, of Falmouth and just do a report, what it looked like historically, what it's going to look like in the future, and what are all these structures and houses doing to the shoreline itself. They, they wrote a wonderful report, and I believe that's on the town of Falmouth's website, the Coastal Resources Committee. But what they found in terms of shoreline change, the rate of erosion along the south shore of Falmouth, and if you look at the south shore of Falmouth, there's a lot of seawalls, revetments, particularly groins, jetties at the harbors and so forth. They come up a rate of erosion from 1975 to 1994 in Falmouth's south shore from 1975 to 1994 is five times the rate that prevailed over the last century. So again, don't look at that last one statistical term. Look at what the shoreline's been doing most recently because of this with, uh, acceleration we're seeing in its sea level rise. So it's, it, it, it's important to know how to read the data. So let's bring man into, let's, let's bring, um, let's bring people into the, into the story here, talk a little bit about this. Now, how has human activity changed the coastal landscape? Well, if you've traveled around the country, that's, uh, it, it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious what, you know, what the changes are that people are trying to do, and they're trying to protect their property. It's an understandable, I think, response from people who own waterfront property. But well, let's look a little bit deeper about what it's doing to, actually doing to the shoreline. This is my neighborhood. This is Brant Rock, part of Marsh built on the south shore. And, you know, these seawalls, this vertical wall here was built uh, back in the 1930s and 40s, and it was built with sand and pebble and cobble from the beach. Didn't know any better, so they built all these seawalls. And I'll show you a few more pictures uh, about these. But uh, this is what it looked like in the early 1900s. At least there was a little knee wall here, a little sandy beach. It was before they connected this bedrock outcrop here uh, with riprap. And you know, it was pretty okay, and this is what it looks like today at high tide. Uh, pretty standard response when you cut off a sediment supply. 
this is in the, in the town of Situate, is um, a drumlin, a glacial deposit, much like an outwash plain, it only has, it has everything in it. It has clay, silt, pebbles, cobbles, sand, and boulders in it. But this is a drumlin, this is Fourth Cliff, and you can see there was a little sandy beach, but because these houses were threatened, um, this is what it looks like today. Slowly, rock by rock by rock, they built this, and uh, they didn't actually build it, the state built it. So, um, and I was on the FEMA site business just recently, I'm uh, looking at the um, alterations that happened to these repments rep along the shore, and they're up to, uh, I think, around three or four million dollars just to reset these stones. Thank you very much for your contributions, <laughs> because it's tax money that's going to pay for it. But in any event, um, the houses are safe. They provide a huge tax base to the community, and that's why the community, I think, you know, by the regulations, um, one of the reasons why they would allow that, because they, you know, if some, a lot of them are primary residences, and they do provide a huge tax base to the community. But at the same time, you're giving up other things. You're giving up for the interests of the public, but, you know, primarily the um, uh, the sandy sandy beach intertidal habitat and other things other things as well. Uh, I'm a collector of old postcards. I love to find a postcard, and I, I'll buy it if it's stamped if it's stamped dated on the back. And then I'll walk along, I'll go along the shore, and I'll try to find where it is. And I try to find the exact location and take another photo now. And I have a, a series of these, but I'm only going to show you this one here. This is Southern Plymouth, right before you get to the Cape Cod Canal. This is August, it was uh, postmarked August 1911. Here's the houses here. There's a little bit of an erosion scarp here. They don't look like they're doing too bad. But I saw the postcard, I said, oh, I'm going to go out and find it. Well, sure enough, I found it. Here's the house right here, still standing. So this is in 2003. Beautiful, heavily vegetated dune, uh, uh, coastal bank. Beautiful, uh, vegetated um, sand dune in front of it. Bang. Enter, the, enter Sandy, enter the Northeast Storm a week later. Nemo, the early March, uh, the early March Northeast Storm. And I went out last week, just last week, even just a few days ago, I believe, August 19, uh, April 19. And just because of that short-term, that short-term impact, they got a little nervous. They were built uh, before the promulgation of the date, uh, promulgation date of the regulations and could be considered for um, structural armoring under the state regs. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But this is, what, um, this is what they're doing now. In fact, if you turn around and go the other way, that revetment just continues across the public beach as well. What will happen in the future? Um, let's, let's see. <laughs> let's take a look. Now, in terms, of, um, in terms of what the impacts of some of these shoreline structures are, um, passive erosion. Again, this is my neighborhood in Brant Rock. This is just a little bit north of where you just saw. Here's the early 1900s here. You'll see what it looks like. And this is what it looks like here today. So a revetment was built um, by the state and with a little contribution from the homeowners. But what do you lose? Well, you lose the use of the beach. You lose access. You lose recreation. And you change the habitat. You lose the existing habitat, but it changes into another habitat. What it changes is changes into is a cobbly, rocky, intertidal shore, as opposed to a sandy substrate. So the biological organisms have to change as well. You lose the natural storm damage prevention and flood control that a coastal beach provides, and aesthetics is in the eyes of the beholder, and that's entirely up to you. And what do you gain? Well, you're still having storm damage reduction. You're changing the habitat. There's a financial security, at least for the first row of houses. But that Heinz Center report, it's uh, pretty fascinating because they get into the economics of shoreline development. And what they, have, and what they came up with is, um, over time, once you lose the beach and the storms continue, the front row houses generally keep their value, but the back row houses begin to drop a little bit because you've lost the amenity of the public resources in front of it. And that's, there's a, a whole chapter devoted to that in that Heinz, uh, in that Heinz Center report. So, you know, just an example of what it looks like from the air. This is Mashpee. All of this area here is revetted, protecting all of these beautiful houses, keeping the tax, you know, the tax base for the community for, for what they provide. But they've lost, the, you know, the reason why, one of the reasons why they live in the shore. There's no dry beach there anymore where they used to be. And if you go down to the Wakoit Bay Estuarine Research Reserve property, the golf course, you can see you have these bar the barrier beach and this beautiful sandy beach. It's no, it's no secret. We know exactly what happens. But this is an interesting story here. This is U.S. Fish and Wildlife property. This is uh, in Chatham. And here it is, here's, here's the Fish and Wildlife, um, here's the stairway here, here's the Fish and Wildlife property here. Well, they all, they own all this land down here. And this is privately owned, but they own the beach. Now, these houses were threatened. The breach in 1987 that, that occurred through Nosset Beach, homes, uh, the, the, the coastal banks got scarped. The homes were in jeopardy. So they came in and said, well, we need to protect our property. So they were allowed to build this revetment provided they keep a minimum of a six-foot-wide dry sandy beach in front of the revetment so folks can come down the stairs, 
walk along what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife owned to get to this beautiful piece of property here. Well, within about three years, they just said it's absolutely impossible to keep a sandy beach. They said, we can't do it. We could put in the sand out, the sand disappears like, you know, for the first wave cycle. So they did remove that, um, that condition. And now if you want to get to that beautiful piece of property down here, you can walk along the asphalt road here. But you can walk there at low tide. You just have to walk in the water on the way back. That's, it's still pleasant to walk in the water, but it's just, uh, I think, demonstrative. Um, all of the, uh, all the, all the uh, erosion control structures are, are, have been mapped um, with, uh, with a grant from Coastal Zone Management and Department of Conservation and Recreation. You can see this blue line. I'm showing this just because this is, this is my neighborhood. This is where I live. I live down here, I live down here 25 feet above sea level. But I, I have to get home before the storm because I have to drive across the barrier beach. A paved barrier beach, of course. But you can see this blue line. This blue line is uh, the, uh, the coastal engineering structures, and this is what they are. We've got revetments. You saw this here. We've got these vertical concrete seawalls that were built in the 30s and 40s. Well, that's what you're seeing here. But but these maps are available from this from this coastal atlas, uh, showing what what type of structures, where they are. So now, if you want to know what they do, you can just look at the extent of these. Just go to these areas, and you can you can visually see what these types of structures, in the long term, uh, can end up doing. This is that area. This is the town of Marshfield. I, Hesitate to say this is the town I live in, but I don't. It's still it's a nice town. But the problem was in the 30s and 40s. I would like to think we didn't know any better. Building seawalls, vertical seawalls to protect these structures, and taking the sand and the cobble and the pebble from the beach to make these walls. They're deteriorating from the inside out. They're getting hidden waves, and they're getting deteriorating from the outside in you know, outside in as well. You can see this is the condition. This is one of the worst ones here. This is the condition of the wall, drum and riprap just to hold it until we can get enough funds to rebuild the walls. What they're doing also, you can see how big, much bigger this is. They're accommodating the walls now to accommodate sea level rise. They're building the walls two feet higher. So they've recognized the, the issue of sea level rise and they're just trying to maintain this very, very densely developed shoreline uh, by building the sea walls higher. They're still building them with concrete and they're putting toaster on riprap, uh, riprap in, front of, in front of them. Now if you look at them, it's costing about approximately at the present time about $2,500 per linear foot uh, to, replace, to replace these walls. Um, and again, you know, you, know, you know what the impacts are. Placement loss, sediment impoundment. This, the primary source of sand, pebble, cobble, and so forth, the primary source of sand that allows, that, that created the beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches that we see today came from the erosion of these glacial uplands. That's the primary source in any glaciated env environment. Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, a little bit of New York, Oregon, uh, Washington. The primary source of sand comes from the erosion of these glacial uplands. So once you build these walls, you've cut off the sediment supply. It's very obvious what you do. Very similar to a bank account. You stop putting money in the bank and you keep taking it out, you eventually go broke, or you eventually lose the resources. So they calculated it's about $600 million just to do patch repairs and about $1 billion to replace these walls. Now, of course, the communities don't have that kind of money, so they're, they're asking the state, who was primarily responsible for building them, who's responsible for building the walls? Well, guess who said, it's not my responsibility? Everybody. <laughs> it's, like, it's not my responsibility, I don't have the money. And so the state doesn't have the money, the towns don't have the money. So what happens? Well, we're, 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 a, we're a home rule state. So, town meeting. You can always get money out of town meeting, can't you? Well, tonight, I'm missing town meeting. In Marshfield, the waterfront residents have convinced the town to ask for $5 million from the residents of this one little seaside town to, to pony up and pay to repair the seawalls that are protecting protecting his homes. This is a warrant article that's on the town meeting uh, town meeting tonight. I didn't want to go because I know I'd be I'd probably be heckled with my if I told them I didn't want to pony up. <laughs> but anyway, twenty five hundred dollars a linear foot. This is what they're doing. Question is who pays? The state does contribute money, but you know the the state of finances these days they don't have a lot of money, so they'll they'll put some money in. Every year the town of Marshfield and Situate put in about two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars per year. Now they're asking for a pretty sizable chunk, and I'm interested to see how that goes. So let me spin it around, and I'm going to ask you the question now. If this were your primary residence, looks very, it looks very, much like a certain, looks very much like a certain shore in Nantucket, doesn't it? The eastern shore of Nantucket. This is southern Plymouth. It's outwash plains. It's a ge geologic deposit. But here we are here. There's a number of houses along the top there. If this were your house, if it were your primary residence, what would you do? 
And I find myself now, because I've been for, I've worked for the feds, I've worked for the state, worked for the county, worked for the local, I'm in private practice now. I'd rather go back into the public sector. But now, now I'm, I'm dealing with the reality of it. What do you, you know, what would you do? What would you choose? Would you choose to do nothing? Let your house go. Would you try to relocate Landwood? Obviously that's the best alternative if you've got the land. Relocate Landwood, avoid the problem. Or would you use an erosion control alternative? A structural or non-structural alternative? And this is where I sort of took most of my slides out because I thought I'd go into a little bit of the management issue that um, Sarah was, was, uh, was talking to me about. But this is the dilemma uh, that we find ourselves in. The decision maker, the property owner. The property owner wants to maximize the use of the property. They want to keep it looking beautiful to maximize the value of the property. The, con the consultants need to satisfy the client. They need to make a profit or go out of business. They want to maintain credibility so they need to do a successful design. Regulators. The regulators need to enforce the regulations, but they're also resource stewards. You've got to understand the science behind all of this. So the selection of an erosion control structure, it's easy, it's easy to know the whole gamut. And this is, I've got, and this is what I was going to do, show you pictures of, pictures of all these things and talk about the function, because I've been tracking these all my career. I go before structures built, non -stru structural or non-structural, the core wraps, seawalls, revetments, I go out before it's built, I go out during it's built, and then I try to get back every few years and to, and to see how it actually functions. What works where? What works well? What are the impacts? What are the pros and what are the cons and so forth? So it's easy to come up with a, you know, the list of everything that's available, structural, non-structural. For my house, I want the biggest, baddest revetment you can build me. I'd want 12 to 15 ton stones in front of my, in front of my house. I want my house protected, it's my, it's my investment. So I want the biggest one, but I also want, I want protection. I want it to be reasonably priced. I want a nice view. I want to maintain my access to the ocean. I'd like to keep the sandy beach in front of it. If I could, not I want privacy. So I'm looking for the balance as the homeowner. Okay, now let's talk about what happens when we make, on the, uh, well, let's talk about the other side of the coin in making that, in making that particular decision, okay? So if you want to balance the consequences of any type of erosion control structure. You have to understand, one, how the shoreline functions, coastal processes, sediment transport, erosion, um, sediment sinks, sediment uh, sources, and so forth. So you've got to understand the scientific principles of coastal processes. What are the beneficial functions of these landforms that we're going to eliminate or alter by this particular structure? And you've got to understand that. And if you know the, wetlands, the state wetlands protection regulations, they're broken up into, into resource area, beach, dune, coastal bank, land subject to tidal action, coastal storm flowage, and so forth. And in, and in a page and a half, it describes what the science be is be behind the beneficial function of the resource. I think the, the technical people who wrote that, I think, did a marvelous job picking a textbook and powering it down to a page and a half, just explaining what the landform does. What's the beneficial function that that landform actually provides? And as I mentioned, the first important fundamental concept of coastal processes in a, glacially, in a glaciated environment is this, the sediment that comes out of these banks allows for the existence of beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches. Behind the barrier beaches are bays, estuaries, harbors, and all the marine biological organisms that live in there. If it was not for the erosion of this, you wouldn't have barrier beaches, erosion of these glacial landforms, you wouldn't have barrier beaches. So you wouldn't have the beautiful marine organisms that help feed the commercial fishing industry. So just think about the whole complex and how the whole thing works in, symbi in symbiosis. So, um, one of my colleagues at the Oceanographic Institution on the back of a napkin said, well, if this shoreline is eroding at about three feet on average per year, this amount of sediments coming out of it, this is the width of the beach, in about 100 years, the Cape Cod National Seashore beaches would not exist if you built a seawall or revetment along the entire length. And that's just basic, you know, basic mathematical principles. Um, and that will happen anywhere where you build a structure if it's the primary sediment source. The eastern shore of Nantucket, Cape Cod National Seashore, southern Plymouth, uh, Wellfleet. Uh, so understanding the principles is important. And that's the basis, basically, the, the science behind why the state wetlands protection regulations are in place. And I don't know how much um, Jeff is going to go into it, so are you going to go into the state regs? Or? Sure. Okay, so, I'm, so I'll, I'll avoid it. But uh, Jeff's going to go into the regulations, so I may avoid that. But I'm just going to say that the scientific principles of coastal processes are embedded in the regulations. That's why the regulations are made the way, the decisions are made the way they are. 
So it's not just affecting your property. You've got to look at it as a system. Well, is it going to affect my neighbor? Is it going to affect the biological resources that support the, that support the commercial fishing industry? So look at the whole thing, you know, as a, basically as a system. So that was just based on coastal banks, but I'll leave that uh, for Jeff to describe. Coastal dudes as well. You know, they looked at the scientific principles behind how they function, and then they said, okay, this is what we should allow and not allow in these areas in the public interest. So, but not only are we trying to protect the beneficial functions of these resources, but the finances behind it as well. Um, 180 million Americans spend about $74 billion on visits to the ocean bay beaches each year throughout the United States, including the islands. And that was done by Jim Houston in 1996. Uh, a lot of that background information and the calculations are in that Heinz report as well. Um, so again, what we're doing is we're looking at a complex. You know, we're looking at rocking into tidal shore, coastal beach, coastal dunes, salt marsh. We've got a barrier beach here. This salt marsh and all the marine organisms and the fish run behind here that allow the fish to grow, to go into the ocean and be caught, they're all here. They're all starting in this little, in this little estuary here behind the barrier beach and the sediment source of the coastal bank. So we're looking at all of this basically as a system and that's the way you've got to do it. So to me, planning is the key. And that's when Sarah said, well, we're starting a coastal management program. We're breaking, breaking the island up into sections. And I said, that's, that's fantastic. You're already, you're already doing an incredible job out here. And it's not an easy job trying to tell people what they can and cannot do with their property. Probably one of the most difficult things I've ever run into. So I, I have to admire the people who are actually taking the time uh, to do that. But planning, planning is the key. Understanding the scientific principles and the data and how to read the data is going to allow you to keep that going. And I'm just going to show uh, several examples in case you haven't thought about, thought about these key things to put into a, a management plan when you're thinking about managing your coastal areas. Obviously, one of the first things you can do, if you're in an area that floods frequently, Elevate the house, elevate it on open piles, let the water flood under it. This house was raised with the hazard mitigation. You can help homeowners, they'll pony up anywhere, anywhere between 25 to 75 percent. If you can show that your project is going to reduce public expenditures in the future. So by elevating your house, you're obviously going to reduce some type of public expenditures. You can see they're still on a solid foundation, they're elevated on piles. No damage to the house whatsoever. There's significant damage to the internal part of this property. So elevating a house. This is a, an A zone. An A zone is, the, is, the, is mapped on the flood insurance rate maps as still water elevation or less than a three foot wave. The three foot wave was identified as the, as the minimum wave that can cause structural damage to a typical brick or wood veneer house. So the, the flood insurance rate maps are broken up into the A zone and the, and the velocity zone. The A zone, still water flooding or less than a three foot wave. It's actually not three feet. If you read the literature, it's actually a foot and a half. I don't know where they came up with three feet, but I, I dug into, the, into why they made that decision. It's actually a foot and a half wave, and they just recognized that recently, and I'll show you how. In velocity zones, um, you're required by the state building code to put your house on open piles or piers. Um, either open, they do allow breakaway walls that will break under the force of the waves, but most communities don't like to break away walls because it creates debris battering rams ahead of the houses. So a lot of the communities now are saying, we don't even want breakaway walls. And this is where it comes in. FEMA standards are minimum standards. They have many, many, many recommendations. Well, maybe you shouldn't use breakaway walls. Maybe you should only use driven piles. But those are recommendations, and they're doing that. It's up to the community in a home rule state to be more stringent than those minimal standards. So under the flood insurance, uh, flood insurance program, all the coastal communities in Massachusetts participate in the federal flood insurance, in the national flood insurance program. You're required to have the lowest horizontal structural member of your building above the base flood elevation, which is the 100-year flood elevation. Well, when was the last time the flood insurance rate maps were updated? And is, is sea level rise to a point now where those waves are hitting the lowest horizontal structural member? Yes. So, what the uh, State Board of Building Regulations and Standards did in Massachusetts several years back is they're now requiring you go two feet above the base flood elevation, above FEMA's 100-year flood elevation. That's a, um, a Massachusetts state requirement now as well. Uh, Rhode Island, for example, requires a one foot above the BFE in the A in the V zone. So it's up to the community to, if they want to look at the A zone. The Board of Building Regulations and Standards just will deal with the high hazard zone, the velocity zone. This is in, this is in the upper reaches of Buzzards Bay where there's an anticipated 25-foot storm surge from a, uh, from a typical hurricane or a 100-year storm. And you can see what the, what the community, I just find this pretty, uh, pretty stunning, actually. But when that 25-foot storm surge hits, chances are these people in the houses are going to be safe because they took the time and the, and the expense to do that. So aesthetics aside, 
Um, now, what's called freeboard, now you can do this in your, you know, freeboard is basically some distance above the base flood elevation that any community can do on their own. You know, and again, we don't have a freeboard, we don't have the required freeboard in an A zone. Maybe something you want to consider. The A zone still has a three foot wave or less. And if you read the literature, it's the one and a half foot wave, not the three foot wave. At least that's what was documented in the literature that I read. So free freeboard is basically just requiring some distance above the base flood elevation. And, and, and it's in the interest of the homeowner. And if you raise your house three feet above the base flood elevation, in a velocity zone, the average, the average flood insurance premium might be somewhere in the vicinity of three, four, five thousand dollars per year. You can drop approximately, approximately two thousand dollars off that if you go three feet above the base flood elevation. So there's a real incentive, not only for the community to help preserve their communities and the structure and so forth, but the homeowner can gain as well in terms of reducing their flood insurance premiums. This was hurricane, this was right after Hurricane Bob. Um, this is me, <laughs> standing here. 29 houses completely were washed out. 29 houses, there were three houses left, they were on open piles. They weren't driven enough so they all had to come down, but the point is, is that the superstructures remained. They were all allowed to rebuild, but they sent me in front of the cameras when I worked for the state at the time and they said, what do we do with the septic systems? You can stand on one end of this barry beach and see the little bay behind it. It was so low, they knew that the groundwater was extremely high, the state said you can't rebuild. It would, be, it, 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 would be, it would be wrong for, the, for a government agency to say, oh, go back and put your septic systems where they're going to be flushed by the tide. They come out and said, you can't rebuild. Well, you can imagine what the storm was that occurred when they said, we've been here 100 years and you tell us we can't rebuild again. So the doors closed and, then, and several folks said, figure it out. So we closed the door and went inside and we decided that, yes, they were grandfathered. They were there for over 100 years, survived other storms, but this just happened to be the one that knocked them out. So what they did was they required the septic tank to be elevated on these decks and gravel pack leaching trenches in the, in the beach. Ideal? Absolutely not. But it was a balance that needs to be met sometimes when you're looking at waterfront property, looking at the regulations, looking at the fairness issue, and looking at the legislature standing in front of you. I don't work for the government anymore so I can say that. <laughs> All right, now, um, a couple of other, just a couple of other suggestions that the Coastal Zone Management um, can look at. Oh, are you going to talk about the flood insurance right now? Ah. This is, there's only about two or three more things to go. Um, the coastal A zone. Now I told you that it's a one and a half foot wave, not really the three foot wave. FEMA finally recognized that. They're suggesting that, um, and, and they will put this on your flood insurance rate maps when they're revised. They'll put the coastal A zone on there. The coastal A zone is the area right behind landward of the B zone that has a one and a half foot wave. Fantastic idea, but it's not a requirement. It's up to the community to decide whether or not they want to adopt it. I think it's a, I think it's a, a great progressive thing for FEMA, for FEMA to be actually putting in, putting these on the flood insurance rate map and allowing the communities to choose. And this is basically what the coastal A zone looks like. You got a three foot wave. You still got a standing wave, but you can require those to be put on open piles. Again, a benefit for flood insurance, a benefit for the building um, setbacks. Almost every community along the Atlantic Seaboard has some form of setback. Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina do it on erosion rates. Others have a standard 50-foot setback like Nantucket, uh, Rhode Island, um, and, and many others. But setbacks are just something I think that you, that you can consider. Okay, acquisition. There used to be an acquisition fund for coastal properties, but it was only $5 million nationally. That has been folded now into the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. So those monies are still, available, are still available for acquisition. It doesn't happen a lot on coastal properties, basically because of the expense, but it has been done. It was done in um, Situate, and it was done along uh, Surf Drive in Falmouth as well. So acquisition, if the property is worth the value. Um, Chatham went to court on a, uh, on a coastal conservancy district, basically a zoning district. They don't allow um, new structures to be built in the floodplain. Now this was an A zone, still water flooding A zone. Um, uh, they prohibited a, a, a house from being built in this A zone. It went to court, and it was upheld in the court that it was a justifiable zoning bylaw to not allow construction in the floodplain. It was a phenomenal decision. But um, the National Sea Grant Law Center has a has a uh, go on their website. They have a description of, of the court case uh, court case, and Mass CZM has one as well. So. Uh, 
Now, you know, so in terms of coastal erosion, you know, what's the future? I know, that, I know that the Eastern Shore has tried just about everything. I was on the monitoring team for the beach face dewatering system, which when I was working for the state, I was on the, uh, the team looking at monitoring the data. And I know they've tried a number of things, the dewatering terraces, wild log, fill, they tried just about everything, attempted beach nourishment. But, um, you know, um, what, is, you know, what is the future? Well, I think we're going to continue to look at proposals coming in for trying to protect these waterfront properties. Is there a silver bullet? There's no silver bullet. We've got to take it step by step. But I think what you're doing in terms of a coastal management plan, open up your mind, understand the coastal processes, come up with the best you can in terms of preserving the island, because I think you're doing a heck of a job out here in terms of preserving the, the value of this island. And I'm going to leave you with this one thing. I told you at the beginning, I was just sitting back, uh, I think I was having a beer the other day, done with my talk here, flipping through the geologic history of Cape and the Island by Bob Odale. And the last, one of his last pages, I think it's the third to last page, he said this here. The, build, the fate of Billingsgate Island located offshore wealthy in Cape Cod is likely a harbinger for all of Cape and the Islands. The good news is that sooner or later, every piece of property on the Cape and the Islands will be on the waterfront and have a waterfront view. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you.